All right, I want to welcome everybody back to the Fitz News Studios for another edition of the Week in Review. Before I get into this week's edition, though, I want to thank Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects, for filling in incredibly well last week when I was on the floor with COVID. Uh, in fact, I, I was apparently patient zero in my family, literally infected my wife and all seven of our kids. So how about that? Um, but we got a great show today, folks. It was a huge week of news. Basically, we've had three huge weeks of news here at Fitz here in August. The summer heat has been heating up the headlines, folks. We're going to start off with a big story out of the South Carolina upstate, the Rockstar Cheer Saga. This story has blown up and folks, it's just getting started. We're going to provide that update in our first segment. We're also going to talk Murdoch's because it was a huge week of news on the Murdoch murders, crime and corruption front, particularly as it relates to the jockeying for position ahead of Alec Murdoch's upcoming murder trial. So we've got a lot of updates on the Murdoch saga to share with you. We're also going to talk about Gamecock football. It kicks off in nine days. What is it now? Seven days. It's a week away. Unbelievable, folks. We're going to get into the Gamecock fan base and an argument over a mascot. I don't get it, but anyway, we're going to talk about that. Also, an abortion update from the South Carolina State House and some big moves being made against gang violence in South Carolina at the federal level. We're going to talk about all that and much more on your Week in Review. All right, so our first segment today, we're going to talk about the Rockstar Cheer Saga. Now, this story began on Monday of this week when 49-year-old Scott Foster, who is the owner and founder of Rockstar Cheer, was found dead in his vehicle at Paris Mountain State Park, just north of Greenville, South Carolina. It was shortly determined thereafter that Foster died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head at the time of death about 12.30 p.m. on Monday. Now, Foster's death sparked an outpouring uh, of sympathy, uh, of of positive response from the community up in Greenville. This guy, again, is an institution up there, has run this business, which has had hundreds, if not thousands, uh, of cheer students come through, especially when you count in their, their nationwide presence. This is a franchise. It's not just a facility up in Greenville, but just a hugely positive response, um, uh, celebrating his life, a lot of tributes being made online. But it did not take long, folks, for the narrative to start shifting. And as we began our reporting of Scott Foster's suicide, one thing became very clear, that there were allegations that he was under investigation for alleged sexual misconduct with underage girls, specifically girls who were under his care at the Rockstar Cheer Studio. Now, one day after we reported on Foster's suicide, Fitz News exclusively reported that indeed the United States Homeland Security Investigations Unit, which is a division of Homeland Security, uh, Department of Homeland Security, was conducting an investigation not only into Foster, but into Rockstar Cheer itself. Um, according to our sources, this investigation had been underway for at least a month, possibly involved undercover assets, and was, again, zeroing in on these allegations of potential sexual misconduct. Now. We've been told that Foster was not the only target of this investigation. We've also been told that in the immediate aftermath of his suicide on Monday, that computers, laptops, cell phones, other electronic devices, an iPad were reportedly seized by federal investigators who are looking into these allegations. Now, I do want to point out here, this is not just a federal investigation. This is a joint investigation featuring HSI and the Greenville County Sheriff's Office. So I do want to point that out. There is a very important local component to this investigation as well. But as we began to report on this story and as this week began to unfold, I've just got to say, I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing this, this job for nearly a decade and a half now. Uh, I have never seen a story go from zero to 100 as far as the tips, as far as the speculation, as far as the chatter. Uh, as this story. Never seen anything like it. Uh, Jen Wood, our researcher, who, by the way, is in the cheer uh, community. Uh, she's registered, in fact, with the group that oversees uh, these cheer uh, factories and gymnasiums and programs all over the country. Uh, so she's got particular insight in this. But Jen Wood has been leading our research on this, and she has just been inundated over the last 48 hours as the scope of this investigation and this story has become apparent. Now, where are things going from here? Obviously, Scott Foster is dead. He will not be charged. 
uh, his part of the story is over. But the question now becomes what happens with the stories of the alleged victims? What happens with others who have been accused of similar conduct, similar misconduct? Where does this investigation go from here? Again, we don't know the answers to that yet. All we know at this point is that this thing is much bigger, much bigger than even we thought it would be at the beginning of this week when this story first exploded on the scene out of Greenville, South Carolina. We've been told there are potentially dozens of victims dating back perhaps as far back as 2005, which would be two years before Foster opened the Rockstar Cheer Studio in Greenville with his wife, Kathy. And the Fosters have three children, uh, two girls, a uh, young boy, um, one of the girls for, uh, active in these cheer programs. And there's been a ton of back and forth on social media from alleged victims, from supporters of Scott Foster. It's gotten very caustic, very acrimonious. Uh, folks throwing barbs and allegations back and forth. Uh, I want to be clear, this news outlet will not, will not identify any of the victims here, particularly the underage victims. Uh, if they choose to tell their stories and they want to tell their stories through our platform, we're certainly more than willing to do that. In fact, if you, if you remember earlier this month, uh, Fitz News did that exclusive interview with Lindsay Edwards, the former victim of sex trafficking uh, out of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, she came on our show, told her story. And I think a lot of folks really looked at the way that we told that story with her, helped her tell that story. Uh, that's how we do it here, folks. We, it's, it's not gotcha. It's not sensational. It's not clickbait. We just want people to be able to tell their stories in the way that they're comfortable doing it. Uh, and so, again, if anyone in this Rockstar Cheer saga wants to tell their story that way at an outlet that's going to handle it the right way, we're here. But, again, we are not going to identify anybody who doesn't want to be identified in connection with this saga. So I, I do want to make that clear. I also want to, as we close out this segment, I want to make one other thing clear. If you've got information related to this, or if you are a victim that wishes to share details, knowing that your, anonym, uh, uh, your confidentiality will be guaranteed, your anonymity will be protected, please reach out to us. And I want to put the email up here, research at Fitz News. That's Jen Wood. That's our researcher. And again, not only is Jen the best researcher in the business here in South Carolina media outlets, but she's also, as I mentioned before, uh, a part of that cheer community. So this is something that she knows a lot about uh, on a personal level. But um, please reach out to us. In the meantime, I do want you to know that this news outlet will continue to keep track and tabs on this investigation as it proceeds. We've got contacts in all the law enforcement agencies that are investigating with attorneys who are involved in this story, with victims, uh, with their families. So keep it tuned to Fitz News for the very latest on the Rockstar Cheer Saga. But I'm going to tell you right now, people, this is going to be one of the biggest stories that we've ever covered. All right, so the Murdoch Murders Crime and Corruption Saga has been bumped to the B block of this week's segment, thanks to the Rockstar Cheer Saga up in Greenville. But I do want to say this shouldn't have happened because this was a massive week for news in the Murdoch story. And in any other week, it would have absolutely led our coverage. Where to start with the Murdochs this week? I guess we'll go straight to the guy who's been driving this debate all week, and that is South Carolina State Senator Dick Harputlian. Harputlian, of course, Alec Murdoch's lead attorney in this case. He is also a sitting state senator who has influence over the appointment of judges. Uh, he's also got the ear of the Biden administration because he played a key role in Joe Biden's first in the South Palmetto State victory back in 2020. So just a hugely influential guy. But Harpootlian has seen his reputation tarnished a bit uh, during the Murdoch saga, and not just his affiliation with a guy as infamous and notorious as, as Alec Murdoch has become, but also just doing a pretty piss poor job of lawyering. Let's, let's be honest. In fact, I've been pretty uh, blunt in my critique of Harpootlian and Jim Griffin and their representation of Alec Murdoch up to this point. But over the last few weeks, and particularly the last week, Harpootlian has seized the initiative in this case. He has been driving the narrative, he has been driving the mainstream media coverage, and he has got a lot of folks speculating that he might even be able to get Alec Murdoch uh, off on these two murder charges. Funny little Freudian slip there. But here's the deal. The week started with allegations of 
leaks coming from the South Carolina Attorney General's office, coming from the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division. And Harputlian has not only raised these leaks as an issue in this case, a public uh, concern, but he has, in doing so, sort of pitted SLED and the AG against each other, a blame game, if you will. And so is it a divide and conquer strategy or is it part of a bigger public opinion push? I don't know. But the end result has been very successful for Dick Harputlin. Again, not only has he seized the initiative, but he's been pitting the law enforcement and prosecutorial forces that are supposed to be on the same team against each other in this drama. So where's the story headed? Where are the leaks headed? Well, hang on a minute. Let me check the phone real quick. (laughs) Oh, there's the leak. There's one. Well, that's a good leak. Oh, man. Well, I hope they don't call me to the stand next week. On that. That's a great leak there. Look at that one. Dylan. Hell of a leak there. But seriously, it's no secret that Harputlian's motions and press conferences and general boisterousness related to the leaks is focused on Fitz News. We're the ones that have broken every major development related to this case. And we're the news outlet which broke the stories that are at the heart of Harputlian's leak claims. Now, I want to rewind the tape here because there's an important bit of context that needs to be addressed in this conversation. Are there leaks? Of course. Of course there are leaks. That's anybody, any investigation, any criminal case is going to have leaks. And let's be honest, Dick Harputlian is one of the best leakers in the business, right? Just ask John Monk at the state newspaper, right? stays in business with leaks from Dick Harputlin. But that's not the story here. The story is the bigger context that we're looking at. And the bigger context is that the leaks shred the alibi of Alec Murdoch. And this is very important. I want to go back to the night of June 7, 2021, back at Mazelle, the Murdoch family hunting lodge where Alec Murdoch is accused of savagely killing his 22-year-old son and his 52-year-old wife. This is a gruesome crime scene, folks. And again, there's evidence that's going to come out at some point. I don't know if it's going to get leaked to TMZ or who's going to get it, but gruesome evidence, folks. But a lot of the evidence we've heard about and a key bit of evidence was a cell phone video from the phone of Paul Murdoch. Now, Fitz News exclusively reported on this back in June. We did not get into the details of that call, but Harpootlian presented it as evidence that the state has no motive. He's been hammering away at this theme for the last two weeks, saying the state has no motive for Alec Murdoch to have killed his wife and son. In fact, take a look at this video, he says. It's a video of them talking, laughing, joking. In fact, I my little joke in the column I wrote was Norman Rockwell painting a family playing tiddlywinks, right? Everything's hunky-dory. Everything's fine and dandy at Moselle. No problems. Nothing to see here. Uh, never mind that there are allegations that Murdoch lured his wife, to this property under the guise of visiting their their ailing father, his ailing father. Never mind that he was under a criminal investigation at the time for a myriad of financial crimes that were crumbling around him. Uh, Never mind that literally that same week he was going to be compelled to disclose financial information in a civil suit that's targeting him and some other equally notorious co-defendants. But hey, everything's fine. Everything's hunky-dory. This was the spin that was put forth by the mainstream media. This was the spin that was put forth by John Monk at the state paper. And again, I got nothing against Monk. Good reporter. He's broken some good news on this. But in this case, he was kind of a tool of the defense lawyers. And again, that's fine. State got some clicks out of it. I get it. But the big story here wasn't a video of some happy family. The big story here was the shredded alibi because Harputlian and Jim Griffin are now being forced to admit that, yes, Alec Murdoch was at Mazelle at or around the time these murders were committed, which is a complete 180 from what they had previously said, which was that it was at his mother's house with, with a housekeeper, with a, a, a live-in care provider. They had three people who could confirm his alibi. Well, guess what? That alibi is gone. It is gone. It has vanished into the ether, people. And now Alec Murdoch's attorneys are admitting he was exactly where these murders took place at exactly the time they were committed. 
Of course, if you read Fitz News, you already knew that because several months ago, we exclusively reported on that high velocity impact spatter that was found on some of Murdoch's clothing, which not only put him at the scene at the time, but literally put him right where one of his victims was killed at the moment they died. And, and we're supposed to ignore all this because of uh, leaks of a video that showed a happy family. Again, Dick Harpootlin's a great lawyer. In fact, I was speaking with Harpootlin earlier this week, and he told me something interesting. He said, you know, Will, I'm not a great politician. I'm probably an average politician at best. But he said, I've been doing this courtroom thing for 50 years. And he told me, this is the kind of case that you go to law school for. This is the kind of case uh, that you get into the profession for. So, folks, if you don't think he is loaded for bear, if you don't think he is dialed in, and if you don't think he is geared up for this case now, particularly after the very difficult few months he's had, think again, because Dick Harpootlin is coming. And in fact, we saw some evidence of that uh, on Thursday of this past week, when Harpootlin made a very aggressive move by subpoenaing multiple agents of the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division, which of course, along with the statewide grand jury, is leading the investigation into not only the Murdoch murders, but all the assorted financial crimes, and the other allegations uh, that Alec Murdoch is staring down. Now, these subpoenas, they were for four different SLED agents. We did a big report on this this past week. But Harpootlin is clearly taking the fight not only to the Attorney General of South Carolina, accusing him of leaks, but he's now taking the fight to SLED, demanding that its agents appear in court next week before South Carolina Circuit Court Judge Clifton Newman. And he told him, not only are you going to have to appear, but you got to bring your notes, your case files, your subpoenas, uh, anything related to this case. Now, things could get very interesting in Walterboro, South Carolina on Monday, folks, and Fitz News will be there. Dylan Nolan and I were planning to provide coverage of that hearing. Harpootlin has been privately whispering to folks that there will be a bombshell revelation there. We assume it has something to do with the leaks. We assume it has something to do with these subpoenas, but clearly this battle is ramping up. And folks, we're not even near the trial yet. The trial is apparently, you know, four months away, three, four months away. We've heard January 2023. It's not entirely clear whether that date will hold. But we're still months away from this trial. We are already in a pitched battle between the defense attorneys and the prosecutors. Now, how significant will this leak component be? Again, I don't know. Will Harpootlin be able to exclude some evidence potentially that he claims was improperly handled? We'll have to see. That could become a component of this debate. But once again, Dick Harpootlian seizing the initiative in the Murdoch murders, crime and corruption over the last week and poised to continue that stranglehold over the narrative at the big hearing in Walterboro next Monday. Again, count on Fitz News for the very latest developments in all the Murdoch murders, crime and corruption saga news as we continue to zero in and bring you the latest on this still unfolding saga. All right, so the abortion issue has blown up. In South Carolina, of course, it's not just South Carolina, it's everywhere. Ever since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, returning authority for regulating abortions back to the states, this has been a dominating issue. South Carolina, there are a group of social conservatives, most of them hailing from the upstate region, the very staunchly evangelical upstate region of South Carolina, who are pushing for a near total abortion ban in both the House and the Senate. And we are going to see those bills come to the forefront early next month when both the South Carolina House and State Senate convene in Columbia, South Carolina for the exclusive purpose of taking up those pieces of legislation. And we've got two different fights unfolding right now. We've got the legislative fight over these bills, which again would be draconian restrictions on abortion, exceeding even the heartbeat bill, which was passed last year. That bill banned abortions after a fetal heartbeat had been detected, although it did include uh, exemptions for rape and incest, exemptions which I support, by the way, even as a, a strong pro-life person myself, I do support those rape and incest exemptions. But the heartbeat bill became the law of the state after Roe v. Wade was overturned. But earlier this month, the South Carolina Supreme Court placed a temporary injunction on the enforcement of that law pending a hearing as to its constitutionality at the state level. And I want to explain this real quickly. Planned Parenthood the South Atlantic chapter has filed a lawsuit claiming that the South Carolina state constitution, not the federal constitution, 
But the state constitution has a privacy right which protects abortions. And they have filed a lawsuit against the heartbeat bill, which the Supreme Court has now told the state, don't enforce the law until we figure this issue out. So that case is before the South Carolina Supreme Court. And it's interesting. I've been told by several of my sources in both the judicial and the legislative branches that the Supreme Court was sending a message to lawmakers by their order in joining the enforcement of this heartbeat bill, basically saying, listen, you're going too far with these proposed bills, uh, which would effectively ban all abortions, including uh, for people who are victims of rape or incest. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. These sources certainly seemed adamant that that was the case, but it is a clear indicator that this debate in both the judicial and the legislative arenas is heating up. But that wasn't the real clear indicator, folks. And I wanted to point this out because I wrote two articles this week. We'll put them in the show notes for you to read. But those articles highlighted just how personal this issue has become. And it also kind of created a situation where, as the editor of Fitz News, I had to figure out how am I going to handle the increasingly personal nature of this debate. And let me explain. First story came out of Charleston, South Carolina. A friend of mine, Lauren Fox, a very successful businesswoman down there in Charleston. Uh, she's had politicians like the lieutenant governor visit her storefront down there on King Street in Charleston. Uh, just a very credible woman who uh, is very adamant in her support of a woman's right to choose. Like our guest columnist, Amanda Cunningham, by the way, who penned an incredibly passionate and personal take on this issue. But Lauren came out on her Instagram page, which is apparently widely followed. I, I, you know, these, all these new apps and things, apparently we're on the TikTok now, who knew? Instagram, TikTok, all these different platforms, whatever. I just call it the TikTok. We'll get into that in a minute. But she goes on her Instagram page and she posts something that calls out the wife of one of these Republican politicians that voted for this total abortion ban and accused her of having an abortion. And so it's like, wait a minute, whoa, this is like seismic allegation of an incredibly personal nature. How do you handle it? And again, I don't really know at this point. Obviously, I decided not to name this this woman, not to name the politician in question. Uh, you know, I get accused of being clickbait, gutter gossip, all that stuff. But, you know, I actually do try to think about these decisions and how they impact people's lives. I try to do the right thing. We did not name the woman, did not name the politician, but it raised the question, how are we going to handle these, these questions moving forward? While we were thinking about that issue, a South Carolina state representative, one of the conservatives who is pushing these draconian abortion regulations, a guy named Josiah Magnuson. He came out on his social media with a post that said that South Carolina Republicans were going to preserve abortion in some form or fashion so that, and I quote, fornication will remain an option. <laughs> Again, I, I just don't know where to go with this debate. I don't know where to go with it. Well, how do you cover something like this? Because you're not covering a court fight. You're not covering the legislative battle. You're not covering an issue. You're covering, I don't even know what it is. Now, having worked in the state house, certainly I'm familiar with the, the fornicating that goes on there, but my news outlet has always had a policy that we just don't get into the personal lives of public officials, unless there's a taxpayer component, unless there's some egregious abuse of power, unless there's some uh, you know, other illegality that ties to the personal thing. Like, for example, they're doing something that's illegal. But other than that, again, I, I'm a libertarian. I try to stay out of that component of their lives because to me, that's not news. To me, that's just you know, bringing somebody down for something that has nothing to do with how they're performing their job. But this is challenging. I mean, I, again, I don't know how exactly to handle it. Because if you think about it, let's say somebody comes up and says, okay, here's a politician who voted for an abortion ban, a total abortion ban, who has, let's say he's married. Let's say he's gotten five girls pregnant and demanded that all five of these, these women have abortions. Is that something to write about? There's a case there. But here's, the, here's where I keep coming back. 
unless one of those women wants to come to me and sit in the chair right here, like a lot of people have, co have come and sat here on so many different issues, and tell that story themselves, I just don't think it's my place to tell it. And again, obviously circumstantial discernment matters. We have to decide things based on aggravating, mitigating factors like a court, court thing, right? But that's going to be my kind of hard and fast rule, at least as it relates to disclosing the identities of people who have, have had abortions. It's not, not my place to do it. But suffice it to say, this debate has gotten personal and it's created a definite challenge for those of us covering it. But I do want you to know one thing on Fitz News, not only will you get the latest news on the debate, on the issue as it unfolds in the courts and in the halls of power at the General Assembly, but you're also going to get different per perspectives on it. And I mentioned Amanda Cunningham earlier, her piece on Monday, an incredible look at this issue from the pro-choice side. And just yesterday, we ran a guest column from Holly Gatlin of South Carolina Citizens for Life, providing another very personal and emotional take on this issue from the pro-life side. So again, that's our commitment at Fitz News. We are hosting a conversation. And if you have an intelligent take on that conversation, whether I agree, whether I disagree, we're going to share it with our readers because, again, that's what the marketplace of ideas is about. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to present the, the best ideas and let the power of the thought be accepted or not accepted in the marketplace. But I want to thank Amanda Cunningham for her amazing column. I want to thank Holly Gatlin for hers. And I want to thank everybody who comes to our site and participates in that debate the way that they should. All right, so if you're listening on the podcast, you can't see, but I am rocking my... Los Angeles Dodgers, 1990s era, Mike Piazza jersey today. I got the Dodgers hat in the background here. I've even got a, a Dodgers hat on. I got, I'm like Charles, what was it Dickens said? The artful Dodger. I am the artful Dodger. But um, as we progress into fall, you're going to see much more University of South Carolina gear. I'm going to be rocking the football jerseys. I've got a killer 1967 game called baseball jersey I'm going to wear. And, of course, all the hats. I've got all the hats. But... As we move into Gamecock football, I wanted to stop for a minute because my news outlet covers Gamecock football, but we don't cover it the way the Gamecock fans like, because here's the problem. Gamecock fans, I, again, I don't know if it's like a cult, like a self-loathing society, I, you know, but any criticism, any criticism of the program, and literally they revile you. They send letters to the editor calling you ignorant ass and like mocking your, your, your appearance. And, and they just get really personal. I mean, you think the abortion debate we just talked about was personal. Wait till you get into Gamecock football. It's a whole nother level of vitriol. But anyway, I, what was it TP to well said, Jerry Maguire? I got a commitment to the truth. I'm just keeping it real. But here's the deal. Gamecock football and Gamecock athletics in general have been historically mediocre. I mean, they're not, not that they've been terrible. It's just they haven't been that good. And so in the years that I've covered it, we've seen some peaks and valleys. Uh, the basketball program went to the Final Four. Uh, the football team actually won 11 games in uh, three seasons in a row back uh, in from 2011 to 2013. So there was some, some, some success. And obviously the women's basketball program, you know, a couple national titles, uh, although they wouldn't stand up for the national anthem, so that kind of soured that. But anyway, my job is to comment on the W's, to comment on the L's, to lay the numbers out, and to let the readers decide. But Gamecock fans, <laughs> their focus, well, let's talk about their focus, where it's been lately. It's been on the damn mascot. I I'm not joking. If you read the mainstream media coverage over the last couple weeks about Gamecock football, it has not been about Spencer Rattler, the new quarterback who transferred from Oklahoma, who, by the way, I think is going to have a breakout year. We're not talking about Carson Wentz here, people. This guy is going to, he's going to succeed and excel under head coach Shane Beamer. And if South Carolina is going to exceed expectations this season again under Shane Beamer, which they did last year, uh, it's going to be because of Spencer Rattler. But Gamecock fans aren't talking about that. <laughs> Gamecock fans are talking about the freaking chicken, people. 
They're talking about Sir Big Spur or whatever his new name is going to be. We don't know yet because apparently there's a competition in the mainstream media over what to name the flipping bird, right? I, and again, I just got to start here again with my own. I just can't with this. I can't with this. This is the same crap all over again. This is the program that, that celebrates first downs, you know, like somebody beat Alabama, right? Oh, it's a first down. My God. Celebrate a freaking touchdown, people. Celebrate the touchdown, not the first down. Oh, wait a minute. We don't score a lot of touchdowns at South Carolina. I'm sorry. And if it's not the first down giddy up, it's the constant uniform changing and the, you know, what are we going to wear this week? Or let's look at this great hype video. We got killer hype videos, people. I, don't, I can't think of another school that's got better hype videos. There's a problem, though. There's not a lot of hype. Mm. Gamecock football. And again, I have the most mellifluously lugubrious, not lugubrious, mellifluous. I'm a mellifluous logo diadalian, people. But I can't even spin Gamecock football. Arguing about the damn bird. Okay, let's go over the list of the names. We've got Cock Commander is the top top name, right? Cock Commander. Cock Commander. And again, this is a program that literally put a statue of a rooster in front of its stadium. They forgot to make it a Gamecock, people. They for, they had to go back and add the spurs later. And now we got a a, a, a chicken with this foghorn leghorn. I don't know if this is a tribute to Henry McMaster, the Foghorn Governor. This waddle on the thing's head. That's not a freaking Gamecock. I was joking this week that we might as well just get the Port Chester University whooping crane and make that our mascot. Have the have the game have you know the whooping cranes come out to 2001 at Williams Price Stadium. Look, I get it. I get it. It's fun to have, you know, something to talk about, all right? It's fun to have some kind of controversy. It's fun to get everybody up in arms. It's good for the state newspaper to sell some papers. Because let me tell you, if they didn't have Gamecock football, I don't know what that paper would do. They'd be done. They'd be done. In fact, when we start our sports program in earnest, watch out. Because we're going to say stuff like this that the mainstream media won't say. We're going to talk about how Gamecock fans are basically one step removed from the the Jones cult and the orange Kool-Aid. We're going to talk about the fact that they identify as fans who have beaten their arch rivals sometime within the last decade. Well, I guess they've done it once. But you got to count the forfeit, right? you got to count the 2020 forfeit. Again, this is my alma mater. This is my school. I have every right to anybody else to call it out. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. Because, again, you can be one of two kinds of Gamecock fans. You can be the kind of Gamecock fan that's in denial, that just reflexively recoils at even the slightest pinprick of criticism. Or you can be the kind of Gamecock fan that insists on holding these programs and failed athletics director Ray Tanner accountable. If you want a better program, be a better fan. That's what I'm saying. But you can count on Fitz News to hold this school and these programs accountable. In fact, if you go back to last year, it was our coverage that led to the resignation of the former University of South Carolina president, Robert Caslin. That's accountability, people. And you'll continue to get it from Fitz News because, again, I don't know any other way. I don't know any other way. That's how I'm wired. And if you want a better program, if you want a better baseball team that's not under 500, you want a non-woke national championship in basketball? And if you want a football program that has a mascot that actually is a Gamecock, you'll insist on that kind of accountability too. All right, so that's a wrap for the Week in Review. Although before we go, I did want to mention one last thing. If you have followed this news outlet for the last year, you know that we have been driving the narrative of getting judges in South Carolina to hold violent criminals accountable for their actions. Those efforts have not succeeded. If anything, Palmetto State politicians have gotten worse 
when it comes to reelecting judges who continue to put the public's safety at risk. But this past week, it wasn't a huge story, but it marks a potentially major development and shift in this narrative. U.S. District Court Judge Sherry Lydon sentenced a defendant to five years in jail on a federal gun charge. Now, this, of course, was a suspect who had been previously released by a state judge back out on the street to recommit violent crime, had a rap sheet a mile long, but it was a stolen gun that was located, that was linked to previous crimes. And as a result of that, this criminal got five years behind bars. And the feds have said, remember, if you go back earlier in this spring, Fitz News did a big story on this, in addition to a big story about stolen guns. But the feds said, we are going to come in and start cracking down on some of these violent criminals that the state is continuing to just catch and release. And so that started happening this week. And that's a major positive development in the fight for a safer South Carolina. And hopefully it will be a shot across the bow of these Republican politicians that continue to appoint judges whose decisions endanger public safety. So again, I wanted to bring that up before we get uh, through with this particular episode. But I got to say, what an amazing couple weeks here at Fitz News. The last three weeks, I just can't even say Dylan Nolan, Jen Wood, this team has been on fire. There's been more content than we've ever posted, better content than we've ever posted. All the metrics are up. YouTube followers climbing through the roof. Uh, and now we're on the TikTok, which means I get to do a TikTok dance or do the floss. I can't floss. What am I saying? But anyway, thank you to everybody who has been following us these last couple of weeks as we have transitioned and evolved and continued to grow. And Count of Fist News to continue to produce that kind of quality content, that kind of content that holds the system accountable and that produces better results for the people of South Carolina. Because again, that's, what, that's why we're here. We're here to host the debate and we're here to try to push for better outcomes. Because again, at the end of the day, South Carolina has been last in all that's good and first in all that's bad for far too long. And that's never going to change until we change the people in charge. It's never going to change until we make those in charge insist on real change. So keep it here tuned to Fitz News for all the latest on these stories. And that's a wrap for this week's editions of the Week in Review.